4th of July, 1776, the day we celebrated our independence from Great Britain. However, not only was it our independence that we celebrated, but the birth of our great nation. A nation that was forged on the sacrifice of pilgrims, pioneers, and patriots. One of men and women who believed in and trusted in God. People who knew his creation and all it had to offer. Selfless men who believed in something much bigger than themselves. I have a dream today. Our founding fathers, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they were simple men, but yet men of principle. These men knew that America had a great purpose. Such men stood to tyranny and declared that a nation should only belong to one creator, a creator who gave us a land where the mountains soar high, where the rivers run deep, and where our children can be free. Our American Revolution took heart and prayer. It took determination and courage. There have been and continue to be countless brave men and women devoted to our country who left the comfort of their homes and loved ones to sacrifice their lives in order to secure our rights and our freedom. We live in a nation that has emerged and grown strong, substantially through the vision and efforts of inventors, idealists, and innovators. The inventive potential and power America has gained and displayed has made us who we are known to be today, the land of opportunity. A people that pursues happiness, a better life, freedom, and a brighter future. We took our dreams and made them a reality. We turned what was thought to be impossible and made it possible in what was one small step for man. It was a great step for mankind. Today, as we celebrate our nation's independence, the sacrifice of our forefathers, a nation that was created for a purpose, as we proudly wave our red, white, and blue and celebrate our freedom, a freedom born of sacrifice, blood, and sweat, as we rejoice to be a part of a nation of mountains and valleys, as we come together in our America, we salute those who gave their lives. We salute those who believe in freedom and we remember that we are one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Hey everyone, happy 4th of July from our nation's capital. We have such a rich history in our nation and this week we stop to celebrate the gift of America. We celebrate the freedom we have today and we remember those who gave their lives so that we can be free. We gather with family and friends to cook out some hamburgers and hot dogs and light off some fireworks, all to celebrate one nation under God. That phrase, one nation under God, is a phrase that some are trying to remove from our Pledge of Allegiance and erase from our nation's history. Yet America was founded as a nation under the authority and under the blessing of God Almighty. As I walk through our nation's capital, I can see evidence and testimony of our godly heritage all around me. Inscriptions and quotes from our founding fathers pointing to our firm dependence on God and on His Son, Jesus Christ. The Washington Monument, built in honor of our first president, George Washington, holds the inscriptions, holiness to the Lord. In God we trust and search the scriptures. And on the cap of this monument are the two words, Laos Deo. No one can even see the words, but they're there, perched on top of the tallest building in our nation's capital, Laos Deo. Two seemingly insignificant words, unnoticed, out of sight, but very meaningfully positioned at the highest point over what many would say is the most powerful city in the world. So what do those two words mean? What did our founders want proclaimed over our nation's capital? Laos Deo translates, praise be to God. And that declaration encapsulates the prayer of our founders. These men, although not perfect, set out to build a nation to bring praise and honor to God. Now some have tried to write God out of our history books and they've done a pretty good job at it. But the truth remains, our founding fathers established this nation on the fundamentals of the Christian faith, not simply on religion, but on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And even before the founding fathers, it was the intent of the earliest pilgrims who traveled to this new land to build a nation that would be governed by the principles from God's word. In 1620, they launched out for this new world. As they were on the Mayflower, making their way across the Atlantic, they formed together an agreement known as the Mayflower Compact. 
And in this article, you see the intent and the motives of the hearts of these first settlers. They stated, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, a voice to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Their mission was clear. They went on to declare, we want our nation to be a stepping stone to take the gospel to the nations of the world. In fact, in Jamestown, the very first permanent English settlement, they held church services twice a day every day. And on Sundays, the services were for five hours. And if you were absent from church any day, it meant you didn't receive your food ration for that day. But when our founding fathers gathered to form our country, they actually looked to the word of God for guidance. Patrick Henry, the man that's known for shouting, give me liberty or give me death, also said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians and not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was George Washington that said, you do well to learn above all the religion of Jesus Christ. In 1787, in the early days of the Continental Congress, there was a lot of arguing on the congressional floor. The old statesman, Benjamin Franklin, took his cane and wrapped it against the floor to get their attention. He rose from his chair and he said this, I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers, imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberation, be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. The Congress then took a two-day leave to pray and seek the heart of God. Coming back, they voted into an act that at no time would they open a session of Congress without prayer. And today, whether you go to the House or the Senate, they open each session with prayer. It's interesting to me that we can open Congress with prayer, but we can't open our schools or football games with prayer. But praise God, we can still open our churches with prayer, amen? As our nation was being formed, the Word of God remained central. Our schools didn't just use texts drawn from the Bible, they actually used the Bible itself. Thomas Jefferson was the superintendent of the Washington DC school system while he was president of the United States. This man who was credited with coining the phrase separation of church and state actually authored the requirement that the Bible be taught at all grades in all classrooms in the Washington school system. Someone once said, tell a lie often enough and soon everyone will believe it. Well, separation of church and state is that lie. It's not in the Constitution, it's not in the Declaration of Independence, and it's not in the Bill of Rights. That statement is actually found in a letter that President Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association. See, the Danbury Baptists were afraid that the government was going to establish a state-run church and try to control the different denominational churches across America. Well, Thomas Jefferson responded by writing, and I quote, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. That wall is a one directional wall to keep the government from running the church, but make sure Christian principles will always stay in government. Did you hear the last part? The wall is to make sure that Christian principles stay in government. That sounds like a different definition of separation of church and state than what we've been led to believe. We've actually been lied to. The Supreme Court and our politicians have made us believe that our nation was founded on this principle of separation of church and state when it's actually quite the opposite. See, there was a time when our federal courts were not so hostile towards God. In 1892, the majority opinion of the Supreme Court, Holy Trinity versus the United States said this, our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teaching of the Redeemer of mankind and it's impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense and to this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian. In 1930, the Supreme Court said, we are a Christian people. The right of religious freedom demands obedience to the will of God. Chief Justice Earl Warren in 1954 said, I believe that no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Unfortunately, one can read today a little bit differently, for our history books have been rewritten and they have removed faith and God from the foundations of our country. 
we've been lied to. Don't you hate it when you've been lied to? Don't you hate it when somebody tells you something that is false and they deceive you? You've been lied to. We've been told that America was not established as a Christian nation, that our founding fathers were not Christian. In fact, some have done all that they could do in their power to discredit our founding fathers. We've been sold a lie of separation of church and state, and we have paid a high price for it. We've been told that kids praying in school would be harmful to their psychological well-being. So in 1962, we took prayer out of the schools. And here was the prayer that they found so damaging. Why don't you pray it with me out loud together right now? Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Well, isn't that just awful? Then we said it would be harmful for students to read the Ten Commandments. So in 1980, we removed those from the walls of our schools. See, we kicked God out of our schools and we replaced him with metal detectors and police. Back in 1940, the teachers were surveyed on the top problems facing the public schools. Guess what they were? Number one, talking out of turn. Number two, running in the halls. And number three, chewing gum. Well, today the concerns are quite different. Guns and violence on campus, teen suicide, teen pregnancy, and bullying. We've been lied to. Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Our foundations have been destroyed, so what can we do? Well, here's what I know. God has always had a plan. All throughout the Bible, when the situation seemed hopeless, God had a plan. When the flood was coming, God worked through Noah to build an ark and rescue humanity. When Joshua faced the fortified city of Jericho, the walls around Jericho were so strong and big that the chariots could ride around the top. Even then, God had a plan for complete victory. When Daniel was in the lion's den, it wasn't the end. It was an opportunity for God to turn things around. And when David faced the giant Goliath, it may have seemed hopeless, but God always has a plan. See, God's people following God's plan receives God's promises. Why don't you say that with me out loud? God's people following God's plan will receive God's promises. Let me tell you what God's plan is for our nation today. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. If my people, it's a promise with condition, but God's promises are always conditional. If you follow his ways, then you'll be blessed. If you choose your own path, well, you're on your own. See, God is talking to us in this passage. He's not talking to people out there somewhere or to the politicians here in Washington, DC. He's speaking to his people, to his church. If we'll humble ourselves and yield to God and seek his face and pray, See, prayer connects us with God, the only one who really has what we need. You may have heard people say before that prayer changes things because prayer moves the hand that holds the world. But of all the things that prayer will change, what it changes the most is us. Prayer changes us, it gets us in tune and in step with God. Prayer tunes our heart to the heartbeat of heaven. And when you're in tune with God, you're ready to be used by God. He goes on to say in that passage that we must turn from our wicked ways. One of the things throughout the Bible that grieves God's heart is when his people begin to follow other gods. Now, we may think that we don't have other gods in our lives today, but a God can be anything that we pursue or desire that's other than God. Anything or anyone that takes our focus or our devotion off of God and puts it on something temporary. God says, if you come back to me and seek me with all your heart, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. I want you to know I have great hope today for our nation because we serve a God of hope, a God of restoration. And God wants to see America return back to him even more than we do. And he's given us a plan right there in his scripture. God's people following God's plan will receive God's promises. And we can believe for the impossible because we serve the God of the impossible. There is hope beyond what we can see with our human eyes. We can believe for the incredible. We can see God do wonderful things because our trust is in his name and his name is our strong tower.
Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, is undoubtedly one of the most significant leaders in our nation's history. He was a man who indeed did his part, and God used him to lead the fight against the tyranny of slavery and hold our country together. Lincoln was also a man of prayer. He is quoted as saying, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. God used Lincoln to turn our nation around, to push back darkness and let the hope of Christ do a work of healing in our land. This is also the place where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech back in 1963. He too was a man used by God to turn our nation around, to push back darkness and restore hope like Abraham Lincoln, Dr. King declared, this isn't right, something has to change. Just like our founding fathers who declared, this isn't right, something has to change. See, God is challenging us to be such a people who will stand up and declare, this isn't right, something has to change. We will be the ones that turn our nation around to push back darkness and let the hope of Jesus heal our land because we know that Jesus is the hope for the world and for the United States of America. Like the Apostle Paul, we declare, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all men. You may think, well, Todd, what can I do? I am just one person. Well, Abraham Lincoln was just one person. Dr. King was just one person. In the Bible, God used Moses to turn a nation around, and he was just one person. David was used to defeat Goliath and save the nation of Israel. See, with God, I'm not just one person. God and I make a majority. So I wanna challenge you to do two things. Speak up and speak out. First, speak up. Let your voice be heard in heaven. Begin praying for our nation, for our leaders, for God to heal our land. Begin to spiritually carry the burden for our country to turn back to God all through prayer. Speak up to God and he will hear your prayers and he will heal our land. And second, speak out. Let your voice be heard in our nation. Don't apologize for your faith in Jesus Christ. Make sure your children and your family know the truth of our nation's godly heritage. Speak out by the way you vote. We have an awesome privilege in our nation to choose our leaders. And as Christ followers, we must select those leaders that most closely align with the word of God. Our hope is not found in a political party, it's found in Jesus Christ, but we do have a responsibility to choose our leaders prayerfully and carefully. So speak up and speak out. I wanna to start today by speaking up in prayer, a prayer for our nation to be turned back to God. And then I wanna invite our campus teams to pray a prayer of blessing over you and your life, that God will fill your life with his power and grace, that it will overflow from our neighborhoods into our nation. Let's pray. God, we thank you for our nation that has been founded on the godly principles of your word and your truth. We seek your face, God, and we pray that you would heal our lands. We pray literally from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific and everything in between that your grace and your truth would rule over our nation, God, and that the hearts of men and women and children would be turned back to you. That as a nation, we would humble ourselves and recognize your authority over our lives. We know that a nation is blessed whose God is the Lord, so we pray your blessing over our nation and over every life here.